Our last panel today is Law and Ethics in a Changing Media Ecosystem. That's really broad, right? That could be almost anything. We may talk about almost anything, but we're going to try to focus a little bit, think of that as an umbrella for a broad set of topics that, that maybe we'll divide into a couple of big buckets. Uh, for the first, we'll return to the overarching topic of the first panel uh, this morning. It's the, the financial and structural turmoil that's plaguing newspapers and the mainstream media business, uh, and maybe pick up some of the spirited debate that we were beginning at the end of Josh's lunch talk. Um, but, but we'll focus on what role can law or changes in law and policy play in helping to shape the evolution, the sustainability of traditional media, and also the emergence uh, of new models uh, of reporting, and new business models. Uh, but we'll be focusing other than on the copyright and hot news issues that you heard about this morning. Um, so those will be things like possible government funding or subsidies or support for newspapers in the media business, expanded funding for public broadcasting and public media, maybe uh, changes that allow newspapers and other media organizations to operate as nonprofits, uh, and the pros and cons that all of those things would bring. Uh, maybe we'll touch on uh, suggestions for changes in the antitrust laws that might allow media operations more flexibility. And then our second bucket of issues, uh, a little more scattered, is going to be ways that the law and changes in the law can actually help new and alternative media models to emerge and, and really continue uh, assume the function of doing journalism. Even if they look very different and operate very different than traditional journalism, how can the law help them actually do good quality journalism? Uh, not to replace what we have, but to work in parallel in concert with what we have. We'll talk about shield laws and the role that they historically have played um, and questions about how they can or should or should not be changed to be more encompassing of new media models. We'll talk about improving access for non-traditional citizen media to government information, government sources, so things like credentialing of journalists for courts, by police, for other government uh, purposes, access to court documents, open meetings and open record laws, and how those can help uh, non-traditional journal journalists. And then issues like just physical access, live blogging from courtrooms, tweeting from courtrooms, and so on, all of which are, are fairly controversial, fairly unsettled areas. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about anti-slap laws, uh, laws that allow you to quickly get rid of slaps, strategic lawsuits against public participation uh, that are designed to shut up people. Uh, and anti-slap laws are a way of dealing with those at low cost, which can be very important for people who don't have a big legal department and a big uh, sort of newsroom behind them. Um, so we've got really a fabulous panel to talk about all of these things and, and more today. And I want to introduce them to you before we uh, kick off. So starting on my immediate left, John Hart. Uh, practices law in Washington, D.C. at Dow Lonis, where he heads the media and information technologies practice. Uh, he represents a lot of media and technology companies uh, across the board and really has been representing people who uh, are traditional journalists as well as non-traditional, people who make money uh, doing the business of journalism for many, many years uh, ever since the Internet came along. His clients include websites, newspapers, magazines, radio and TV, technology companies. He's counsel to the Online News Association uh, and has written extensively on media and technology law. To his left, uh, coming up second, is Dan Kennedy, an assistant professor of journalism at Northeastern and a nationally known speaker on media issues. You can hear him uh, here as a panelist on Beat the Press on WGBH. Uh, he has a couple of books, uh, working on a second one now, about the role of nonprofit community websites in the post-newspaper age, and has spent a lot of time studying uh, the operation of these websites and the challenges that they face. Uh, to his left, Josh Stearns is program manager at Free Press uh, and is heavily involved in their journalism and media campaigns, including uh, this fabulous project called SaveTheNews.org. Uh, part of what he does is brings together journalists and local citizens around the country to try to involve them in some of the policy debates about media and journalism that are going on in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, he also blogs at SaveTheNews.org. Uh, and stopbigmedia.com. To his uh, left, 
uh, is Lucy Dalgleish, the Executive Director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Um, and that's a group, if you don't know, truly phenomenal, a group of reporters and editors dedicated to protecting the First Amendment uh, interests of the media, broadly defined. Uh, reporters Committee has been actively involved in major press cases of all sorts for over 35 years, hugely important. Before assuming this position, uh, Lucy was herself uh, a uh, reporter, and then after that was a media lawyer for uh, quite a few years, and she specializes in part in open meetings, open record laws, shield laws, uh, and so on. To her left, uh, Rob Birchie, uh, who is a partner in the media and internet law practice at Prince Lobel here in Boston, uh, represented magazines, newspapers, online media across the country in every sort of case you can imagine, privacy, copyright, libel, uh, all of the things that plague media business. And in particular, he's focused on helping traditional media try to figure out just what we're talking about today, how to adapt to all these changes and how to adapt to an increasingly online world. He too is a former reporter and serves as general counsel to the New England Newspaper and Press Association. Uh, finally, last but not least, on the end, Cameron uh, Straker uh, is a lawyer who's represented a wide variety of media clients in defamation cases, privacy, reporters' privilege, uh, intellectual property cases for over 20 years. Uh, his clients include very cool TV shows like Dog the Bounty Hunter. Um, uh, and he's written regularly for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, many other publications, uh, and is a professor at the New York Law School where he's involved in uh, their program on law and journalism. So welcome and thank you all for being part of this. Uh, I think really great panel. Um, uh, what I'd like to do to, to have you kick us off is just to ask each of you to go down and take uh, just four or five minutes to, to share your perspective on sort of what you see as the critical issue or issues within these buckets of things we're talking about and, and your perspective on where we ought to be focusing. And then we'll circle back from there and take up uh, three or four of, of the biggest, uh, the most challenging topics. So, John? I would, I would want to start by congratulating the online media legal network and putting together this invaluable matchmaking service. As Phil said, I have served as counsel to the Online News Association since actually before there was an Online News Association. And at a, a board retreat about, I don't know, four or five years ago, we had a facilitator who asked one of those facil facilitator type questions. It, you know, what would you, what would, what will the Online News Association be doing in five years? What's beyond your wildest dreams? Just you know, fantasize. And part of my answer was that we would create what I didn't know at the time was later going to be named by these people, the Online Media Legal Network. I think the service is, is really fantastic, and I think it's going to perform an, an enormous service to, 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 to journalists um, who are trying to figure out the questions we're talking about, about how to, how to survive in a, in a world where you don't have uh, the mothership of, of a big media company to take care of you. Um, in terms of my perspective on this, I think I, I generally do come at the questions we're going to be talking about today from the perspective of someone who has spent most of his career representing um, people who are trying to figure out, either trying to make money or trying to figure out how to make money uh, doing journalism. Um, I am certainly very intrigued by some of the, the uh, not-for-profit business models. Um, and I, you know, as, as um, as Josh was saying at lunch, I suspect that we will wind up with a mix, that there is not going to be a prevailing model as there had as there has been in the past, that they'll we'll have a mix of for profit and nonprofit and subscription and membership services and ad supported services. And in terms of my view of what the government should be doing, I, I I appreciate the notion that the Postal Code has what it was in 1792 a, a subsidy of the newspaper business. I am more, uh, I guess I come at the world more from the perspective that I would like to see the government um, step back as much as it can and try not to interfere with the development of some of the business models that might allow my clients to make money. I'm thinking in part of, of things like uh, regulation of, of behaviorally targeted advertising. And I guess I'll let everybody else go down the line and we'll get back to these topics. Well, I agree with John that uh, we're going to see a mix of different types of um, financial models for news 
sites going forward, a combination of profit and nonprofit. But I do think that nonprofit is going to be a very important and increasingly important part of the mix. Uh, a site that I've been looking at particularly closely is the New Haven Independent. And uh, what they're doing is just so compelling in terms of uh, small, cheap, fast, foundation-supported journalism uh, that I have to think that this is going to be something that we see quite a bit of going forward. And um, as, as we've noted, we're going to be taking up a lot of different issues today. One of the issues that, that kind of nags at me is the, rec is the prohibition on nonprofit organizations uh, from making political endorsements. And uh, believe me, I have written enough political endorsements over the years to realize that, that we do not have large audiences sitting at home waiting with bated breath to tell us you know, who, who to go vote for on election day. But it's a matter of free speech. Congress shall make no law. Uh, what part of no law don't you understand? And um, interestingly enough, uh, I, I think that we tend to believe when we hear about this prohibition uh, that it was handed down to us on tablets by James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, uh, when in fact it really only goes back to Lyndon Johnson's re-election campaign to the Senate in 1954. Uh, he was running against a guy named Dudley Doherty, and there were a couple of uh, right-wing, red-baiting, nonprofit organizations back home in Texas that were essentially using McCarthyite tactics to try to defeat uh, Lyndon Johnson on behalf of D Dudley Doherty. And uh, Johnson managed to push through the Senate a law that suddenly prohibited all nonprofit organizations from uh, working on behalf of or against a particular political candidate. Uh, something that nobody paid an awful lot of attention to over the years, but that I think has become a fairly um, important uh, violation of free speech as we move into this era of nonprofit news. Now, Paul Starr, among others, has suggested that we make um, an exception for for news organizations that are nonprofits, so that they can fulfill this traditional role. And uh, I'm going to suggest something a little bit um, more sweeping than that, and that is that we simply undo what Lyndon Johnson uh, did these many years ago. I think a lot of liberals tend to uh, blanch at the notion of removing this prohibition because uh, it would unleash um, evangelical churches and uh, all kinds of people that, that, that those of us who consider us to be somewhere on the left side of the spectrum uh, tend not to like. But I, I think that this is a great time for all of us to stand up for the fundamental principle of, uh, of free speech and getting back to the spirit of the First Amendment. And uh, just as we are freeing uh, nonprofit journalism from these restrictions, so uh, ought to we restrict the restrictions on everyone else. Great. Thanks, Chad. I'm really excited to be here. When we founded Save the News about two years ago, that's when the idea started to percolate, we were looking at the discussion around the future of journalism, and we saw that really no one was talking about the role of public policy. And now here we are roughly two years later, and we're having an entire conference about the impact of law on journalism and the future of journalism. So I think this is really exciting for me to be here. Uh, Save the News is a project of Free Press. Free Press is a nonpartisan, a nonprofit organization that works to engage people across the country in the media policy decisions that shape everything we see, read, and hear. Um, so we looked out at the, the landscape of media policy and saw that for too long, uh, a lot of policies were being made in the public's name, but not necessarily with their consent. So we work uh, across the country um, doing both uh, 
a lot of original research, a lot of uh, public advocacy, a lot of public education to get uh, members of the public involved. So in terms of Save the News, there's a couple issues that we've been working on. About a year ago, we released a report, which is now already feels dated. Um, and if I could go back and, and revise, I would and, and hopefully will. But a couple things came to the surface in that. One uh, is this question about the role of nonprofit journalism and specifically about our public media system and what is the role for our public media system currently in place in the future of journalism. Do we want to expand CBS, or, uh, CPB, you know, NPR and PBS? Do we need to expand the idea of public media beyond those traditional broadcasting agencies to a more you know, nonprofit web-based journalism and other forms? And if we did that, how do we strengthen the political firewall to make sure that there would be no influence from the government funding and what structures do we need to be put in place? Other things I'm interested in is the intricacies of IRS tax code um, in terms of how do we create flexibility for new hybrid models. Uh, a lot, I think a lot of people are saying, oh, there's problems with the nonprofit model, there's problems with the for-profit model. What are some hybrid models we could look at? I'm really interested in news sharing and partnerships. Uh, around the country, we're seeing news sharing agreements between broadcast stations and others uh, that are really subtractive to local news. So it's actually really detrimental to local news. We're seeing less local news being produced because of these. And then we're seeing really creative partnerships happen uh, between nonprofits, between nonprofits and for profits that are additive. But no one's really looked at what the legal standing around those is. All of these fall outside of the FCC's media ownership rules. So I'm, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in credentialing. Uh, an hour ago, a credentialed nonprofit news organization in Minnesota just uh, got pushed out of the state house because they were non-traditional media. Now they've been credentialed already, they had space in the state house, and their lease is being terminated uh, because of complaints from other people in the state house press corps. Uh, so that press release just went out and this is an issue I'm really interested in uh, in terms of access to our government, especially as more and more nonprofit journalism ventures are emerging. And then the last thing I would say would just be uh, looking at new ownership models and, and what sorts of new ownership models are out there and how can we help transition other current models into new models. Um, and then I would say other issues, net neutrality, media ownership, uh, PEG and community access TV, LPFM and others that are, are in sort of the larger universe here. Well, I hardly know where to start. I've got so many thoughts going on in my head here. But the Reporters Committee was founded 40 years ago with the notion that reporters can help other reporters uh, who are involved in legal battles, everything from libel lawsuits to subpoenas to access to state and federal records. Uh, for 40 years, we've run a 24-7 hotline for any journalist in trouble who needs a pro bono lawyer. We've been doing that. We've never cared who you were working for or whether you were working for anyone. So uh, we've never had any journalist in trouble who ever came to us ever have to pay for a lawyer, and we're very, very proud of that. Nevertheless, um, we, um, we love all technologies. Certainly at the Reporters Committee, we're using all of them ourselves. We do not distinguish between what mode of delivery system you are using. If you are committing journalism, we are going to help you. Um, but uh, I do have some fairly major concerns. Uh, as Samuel Johnson once said, no man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money. And virtually all of the issues we are dealing with these days have to do with money. Uh, if I thought nonprofits were going to, nonprofit journalism was going to save the world, great. If I thought a public system was going to provide all the news and information in an organized um, professional, or by professional I don't mean paid, I mean quality way, I'd be fine with that. But let me tell you something. Um, these days, nobody's making enough money. Everybody knows. You know, I think we've been using the phrase newspapers here. Guess what, folks? People at newspapers don't call themselves newspapers anymore, really. They call themselves newsrooms. They are using video. They are using audio. They are using print. They are using the Internet. They know. They get it. They understand that what they have is something of value. The problem is fewer and fewer of the people who are working for them are able to earn a living doing it, as I said from my high horse up there a little while ago. Um, they're doing a wonderful job of assembling the news and preparing it for dissemination. The problem is nobody's making money on it. 
Uh, and what does that mean? Well, from my standpoint, that really means two things. Number one, nobody out there, if you think about all the cases you read in law school that had anything to do with the First Amendment right or the statutory right to gather information in this country, 99% of them were brought traditionally by a news organization, usually a community newspaper. Think of Nebraska Press Association versus Stewart, Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, Press Enterprises. Think of any state open records law in any state that you are from. That was a local news organization that brought that lawsuit. And as a result of that, everybody else out there has access to that public information, to that public courtroom. If there's not enough money generated out there for this, uh, nobody's going to be out there to fight for this when it gets shut down. Here's my second major concern, also having to do with access. This is a double-pronged thing. Those folks who are in control of those records, control of those courtrooms, they know you can't afford to fight them anymore. So they're acting with impunity. And the internet scares the hell out of them. So what are they doing? I'm going to a conference in New York on Tuesday sponsored by the Judicial Conference of the United States where they are talking about, among other things, putting plea agreements completely off limits because now that they're available on the internet via websites like Who's a Rat, uh, anybody can see information. Personal information is in some court records. Therefore, we shouldn't make those types of records public anymore. They understand that theoretically, you know, on principle, you can't distinguish between records in a file cabinet and records on the internet. So what are they going to do? They want to just make them not public anymore. Uh, we have to deal with some of the consequences here of technology. It's sort of the not so pretty side. I hope we're able to convince these people that on principle, they just have to get with it and understand that we're all dealing with new technology and I th most journalists think, hey, the internet, oh my god, look at all the things we can do. Look what we can get. Look how efficient we can be. Look how we can provide a 24-7 news cycle. Isn't this wonderful? And you know what those elected officials and those appointed judges are saying? It's like, oh my god, the internet. Look what they can do. The mindsets are completely different. And we're going to have to start talking about those particular problems as well. And as I said, I don't really care who pays for all of this. I can tell you from being running a nonprofit myself, it ain't pretty. Um, you know, what happens, you can go out and get a grant to start up just about anything. But if you can't show that you're going to make money or get somebody else to pay for it within three or four years, you're toast. And uh, if you can't, it's, just, it's called sustainability. And guess what? Nobody else wants to come in and sustain a program that has somebody else's name imprinted all over it. So I'm probably a little bit more skeptical about this whole nonprofit notion than most of the people in this room, because the last 10 years, that's kind of been my life. So off my high horse for another 10 minutes here. Hi. I come at this, uh, really, I'm not a academic. I'm not a theoretician. Uh, I don't belong to any think tanks, I'm a practitioner. Um, and so I want to share some of the observations that I have, some of the concerns that I have. And uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to offer a lot of uh, solutions. I will say, though, um, anybody who is not familiar with the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, you ought to go to that website today, rcfp.org, because they are an outstanding organization that uh, many of us would not be able to get through the day without. Um, a couple of journalistic trends that I see. One is I think the model of the objective news source is dying. Uh, a quick death. I think um, there are going to be very few commercially successful uh, news outlets that put themselves out as uh, being the paper of record or even claiming to a certain uh, objectivity. I think we're, we've got a mess out there. We've got this incredible variety of different kinds of news outlets, different ways of approaching things, and frankly, I think it's more like it was at the birth of the First Amendment maybe than we've ever had. Uh, and that's pretty interesting to me, and I think it's a fruitful time. I don't know where this is all going to go. I make my money representing the media. 
Uh, and I can't predict too much. All I know is that I want to throw on my seatbelt and uh, ride where the ride goes, because it's fascinating, fascinating times uh, to be in this field. Um, Josh talked a little bit about uh, local news. I think it's right that the local news at the broadcast level uh, is not where you're going anymore. But I think local news coming from newsrooms, from newspapers, uh, is actually going to hit a renaissance. I think it's going to be more important than ever. I think the hyper-local sites that are coming up, uh, I think we're going to find that that is where the real action is in developing uh, journalistic uh, quality. A couple of concerns um, or observations. One observation um, is that, you know, all you have to do is read about Google and China uh, or uh, the New York Times in Singapore and realize that increasingly, as someone has said, the First Amendment is merely a local ordinance out there. Um, and we've got to realize that. Um, we are increasingly going to be dealing with international norms and have to figure out how to do that. And I think the Supreme Court kicking and street screaming is going to come more and more to be citing those precedents. I don't know where that ends up, but I think it's something we all have to pay attention to. Um, do not think that you shouldn't have an interest in uh, the law uh, libel as it is involving in Britain or in Australia or in Singapore for that matter. Uh, a second concern that I have, uh, you know, the, the juries don't really like us still. That's one thing that hasn't changed really in recent years. Um, and in fact, the most uh, credentialed and the most professional news organizations uh, are often being brought down by the ones that may be less professional. Uh, others that have always been deemed unprofessional are up for the Pulitzer, like, uh, the uh, National Enquirer, which CAM represents, uh, and which broke the story that nobody else would touch about, uh, what was that candidate's name? John Edwards. <laughs> and uh, so a lot's changing there. I worry, though, about an increasing concern for politeness out there in the world. I go into court and I find myself talking to judges who are saying, that's not nice, that's not a good thing to do. Um, some of which may be true, but I don't think that's the role of the law. Well, I, you know, I was in a courtroom arguing in a libel case a couple of weeks ago, and the judge uh, was talking about sort of raising that sort of a point, and I said, well, you know, Your Honor, the essence of the First Amendment is that these are decisions that are made in the newsroom uh, and not in the courtroom, to which she looked over her glasses to me and said, well, they're going to be made in this courtroom. Um, the, uh, around the time of the Pentagon Papers, Walter Bickel uh, made a comment that I'm going to get wrong, but it was something along the lines of that those freedoms are most secure, which are never fully tested. Um, that to the extent we push the limit, sometimes we uh, will develop limits that before had never really been defined and maybe we were freer uh, when they weren't defined. Um, I think as practitioners, it's not a great time to be a First Amendment absolutist. I think we need to be careful about the cases that we bring up on appeal. I think we have to be very aware of the surroundings that we have. The Communications Decency Act in particular, I see as very, very uh, shaky. There are a lot of people who don't think it's fair, and I'm worried to death about uh, Congress going back and visiting that uh, and making changes in it. Uh, the same thing with uh, comments and uh, blogging, the comments on newspaper sites, a hard, hard decision to make. You know, people, even a publisher the other day was telling me she hates comments and that she would not consider getting rid of them because competitively, she absolutely has to have uh, comments on her site. Um, and yet when I met recently with a dozen area police chiefs, the biggest thing they talked about, newspapers wanted to talk about lack of access to police reports, and the police chiefs wanted to talk about those damn comments and the terrible things that people were saying about them uh, in these comment uh, sections. Um, and I could go off on that for a while. But I think um, 
I think I'll leave it at that and I'll turn it over to Cam. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Thanks. <clears throat> I'm also very pleased to be here. I'm a little pissed though because I'm just wondering why this room is so nice. Last time I was here, I remember the paint was peeling off the <laughs> ceilings and there were no lights and just, it seems kind of unfair to me, but uh, so it goes. Um, anyway, I, I worry most about what, I, I worry most that new media is undermining the legal protections of old media or media generally. And I, I'm not sure Lucy and Rob, whether you were saying this exactly, but picking up on some of your comments, I'm concerned about the way that in trying to get the protections for all, we lose some of the protections that come to take for granted. Or Rob's uh, quote from uh, Bickle, I think, is very apropos, that, uh, the, the, that when we push the limits, we suddenly realize that maybe the freedoms we have are not as broad as we thought they were. And uh, just to take it back specifically to some of the issues that we're talking about today, I mean, for example, I think that the, the problems and the controversy in trying to pass a federal shield law uh, arise from everybody's concern that, whoa, wait a second, who are journalists? Does this thing mean that everybody, every blogger is suddenly going to get this evidentiary privilege that we haven't given to them before. I mean, the reporter's privilege was fine and it was a great thing when professional news organizations were out there invoking it, but suddenly when people had to look at it closely and wonder whether the same privilege that the New York Times had been asserting for many years is suddenly going to be maybe able to be invoked by, you know, Sally Smith, who's blogging about, uh, um, you know, some school issue, that, that concerns people. And uh, that may lead to the demise of the federal shield law. It may lead to demise of shield laws generally, although I understand Kansas just passed a, a pretty good one. So I could be wrong about that. Um, I see it in my practice uh, representing reality television shows and tabloids. Um, we used to take for granted the fact that if somebody was depicted on the street and uh, shown on a television program that you had a First Amendment right to show that person on the street. And suddenly now we've seen people uh, saying, hey, I'm on a reality TV show. You're making a lot of money off of me. Yeah, I was on the street, but I want to be paid for that. And so we're beginning to see the erosions of the First Amendment protection for misappropriation claims. Uh, we see the same thing with, uh, with TMZ and all of these websites that post court records online and make them very accessible. Again, we, we've all assumed that we have a First Amendment right to access to the courtroom and access to documents. And suddenly, we're beginning to question that because, gosh, did we really mean that TMZ could post every single embarrassing thing that was ever in a court record? Gosh, maybe we don't really mean that. And so now we begin to see a sort of backlash against all of that stuff. And, you know, I guess that leads me to, to, to wonder how far, as Bob said, we really want to be pushing some of these First Amendment issues. It's great to be a First Amendment purist, but I worry that judges, as Rob describes his judge, looks down their glasses at us and says, what, are you, are you kidding me? I, I read that story. That's offensive. And I, you know, frankly, screw, screw the First Amendment. Or, I mean, they may not say it as overtly as that, but that's really what they're thinking. Great. Well, thank you all. So we clearly need about five hours for this panel, given the number and the, the depth of issues that we uh, could talk about. We're not going to do that, but, but at the risk of shortening the time overall, let me take just maybe four or five more minutes and, uh, Josh, call on you to... So you've raised this idea about the novelty of policymakers and policy actually now focusing on journalism and media and what we should do about it. And I know you've followed uh, very closely and sort of been in the middle of both the FTC and the FCC's ongoing examinations and, and uh, hand-wringing about what to do. Can you give us just a, a little overview of that process and kind of what's going on and, and how you see that impacting what sort of policy changes might actually get made? Sure. Over the last year, uh, the debate over the future of journalism has sort of hit D.C. really hard, and every time a new hearing is called, whether it's uh, our fair senator here, John Kerry, 
calling his hearing, um, or whether ben, it's Ben Cardin's bill that was introduced, Senator Cardin's bill, or the FTC effort, or the FCC initiative that's on right now, we hear this flurry of protest. What are they doing? This, you know, how dare they look into this? In fact, Kevin Smith, the president of, of SPJ, has this really fantastic blog post where he writes about his initial reactions to the FTC proceeding, and then he talks with the FTC and realizes that they actually don't have jurisdiction to do anything that it's the FTC, this is coming out of their, um, basically their studying arm, that they have a sort of think tank section of, and this, they're just producing a report. Um, that said, producing a report is also what the FCC is doing, and both of them are gonna be making suggestions for possible policy actions down the road. So I think it's vital, vital uh, for journalists, uh, lawyers, citizens, and others to be involved. So right now the FTC has hold, held two hearings, um, and they're gonna produce an eventual report. And they've really focused in on antitrust, uh, advertising, and new, new forms of advertising, especially online, and copyright issues. The FCC also has a sort of broad-based future of media initiative, which they're framing as modernizing our nation's media laws, very broadly. Um, based sort of on the Knight Commission report on the information needs of communities. Um, so really all-encompassing. Again, they're looking at things that they don't have jurisdiction over, but they're going to produce a report and make recommendations to other parts of government as well as to own their own internal processes. So their report is focusing um, on everything, but has a particular focus on things that we're discussing on this panel, like new models uh, around um, how we're gonna pay for the news, what are, how has ownership impacted local news, and a whole range of other models. They actually released an 11-page memo with 42 questions in it. So you can find that on our website if you're interested. <laughs> um, Senator Cardin and Representative Maloney have introduced this new pa Newspaper Revitalization, Revitalization Act that is somewhat flawed um, and has sort of been sitting ever since it was introduced. Don't see that going anywhere, uh, but it presents some interesting ideas. The shield law debate is ongoing. And then the other thing that I would say, just again, a quick sort of list of other things that have real found impacts on the future of journalism. Uh, the Comcast merger, media ownership review, the quarterly FCC media ownership review has started again. The net neutrality decision that came down this week and the ongoing proceeding at the FCC. The national broadband plan, especially as we're talking about more and more news and information moving exclusively online. We need to look at the fact that 40% of America doesn't have access to that. The low power FM radio bill, which will create thousands of new community radio stations. And a bill trying to modernize the public uh, and government access television uh, and how that's funded and how that's rolled out in communities. So, DC is alive with discussions about the future of journalism right now, and there's lots of opportunities to get involved, uh, and I'd be happy to talk with any of you about, especially the FCC proceeding, which wraps up May 7th. Uh, the deadline for participating in that is May 7th, and uh, I've got lots more information about that. You can look at freepress.net slash future of media action. That's great, thanks. Now, I suspect that at least a few, maybe more than a few of you on the panel might see the idea of extra government involvement and government help for the media industry is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, but, but let's take that issue to start. I mean, in following up on Lucy's uh, kickoff idea that, you know, it's, it, so much of what we're talking about today is about money. Yeah. And unless people, one way or another, can find a way to fund this business of committing journalism, whether it's uh, the New York Times or whether it's some great hyper-local blogger, a lot of this doesn't matter. So how do we, is there a role for government either in direct support, actual funding, or indirect subsidies, or maybe more on the nonprofit side? What, is there a meaningful role for government to do this that isn't gonna just screw it up? Can I add John? one thing just yeah, to yeah. set this up? I, I completely agree with Lucy's comment. The, the most interesting statistic I've heard about, sort of the, the, the economic change in the news business, was um, Michael Zimbalist, who started the Online Publishers Association and now works for the New York Times, pulled out a statistic that was that the volume of advertising, classified advertising, that used to be in newspapers and is now on Craigslist was a revenue stream of $1.2 billion a year to newspapers, which Craigslist, because it gives away most of its advertising, monetizes to the tune of $60 million. And the rest of that money is just poof, it's gone. And that's what we're really, that's really the challenge that we've got to, we've got to try to. What was that just again? What was that number? $1.2 billion a year now is $60 million to Craigslist and the rest of the money is just gone. It's interesting. At USC, David Westfall uh, did some calculations and he sees that right now, currently, the government subsidizes commercial media uh, for about $2 billion a year in stipends, including uh, postal subsidies, 
legal notices, and uh, broadcast licenses. So yeah, and the legal notices for the small newspapers, I mean, the postage is, you know, fairly obvious. There, there are a lot of newspapers, particularly the smaller ones, that use the Postal Service to distribute. Um, and um, the same thing with legal notices. That's a huge, huge source of revenue. Uh, there's usually in each county one fairly normal size, fairly large size newspaper that gets all of those notices. If that dries up, and you can certainly see why a, a, a government, a local government would want to do it all themselves, some of those newspapers just gone. Right. And, and those are indirect subsidies. You know, they, they have the result of being supported, right. but they're not really sort of overtly designed to do that. Should the government more overtly, consciously say, yes, we're going to support something, whether it's existing business models, evolving models, fairly directly through subsidies, support, expanding public media, whatever? Yeah. No. <laughs> Absolutely you, not. Um, you, you know, the, the role, the, the first role of journalism is to keep an eye on government, uh, not to jump into bed with government. Now, the fact is there are certain types of indirect government subsidies that um, we probably don't spend an awful lot of time thinking about or worrying about. Uh, even in the nonprofit model, if I can make a donation to a nonprofit news organization and write it off on my taxes, that is an indirect government subsidy right there. Um, there is perhaps some very modest role for government along those lines, but I think anything direct uh, gets to be very problematic. Uh, Dan Gilmore actually has come up with what I think is a terrific idea, which is um, let's see some fairly substantial government subsidies to get broadband into every home, and then let news organizations take it from there, but at least the road will have been open for them. And two things I really like about that. One is that it's a very, it's a very important, but at the same time, a completely indirect subsidy. And the other thing I like about it is that it is very similar to the postal subsidies that, that got the press launched in this country and, and continue to be important right up to this day. There's, there's real parallels there that you can see. But uh, direct government subsidies, absolutely not. I think that's a very dangerous road to go down. Rob? I'd agree with that wholeheartedly. I, you know, I worry about somebody from the government saying, we're here from the government, we're here to help you. Um, I do think there's a difference in the kinds of subsidies, as Stan points out, the indirect and those that verge on content. Yeah. It's, it's um, not in my interest, because I know there's a publisher of at least one of my newspaper clients in this audience, to say this, but I have trouble understanding the principle behind opposing the legal notices going online. That seems to me really a matter of trade protectionism, and that putting them online actually makes a fair amount of sense, even though it has a very adverse impact on a lot of my clients. Anybody else want to rush to the defense of direct uh, government? No, I, I would just add my no to the <laughs> string of no's. <laughs> OK. So, <laughs> no, I think I may, I, may be, I may know how this ends up. Um, I actually think that we can't say no unless we're ready to close down NPR and PBS, which I'm not ready to do. Uh, I, I think the question should be, first, can we create political firewalls that would protect journalists who are being, who are, or journalism organizations who are being subsidized, or can we create, some people have suggested a public-private foundation so that the money would flow to a public-private foundation, which would then put the money out uh, to nonprofit journalism enterprises. I think, I think we need to explore this question more. I think that there's examples abroad that we need to look at, and uh, we're doing some of that research now, and I hope to have something for folks soon on that, but I'm not ready to say no yet. Uh, 
I am very ready to acknowledge that any policies we put in place, any subsidies that were to, would go in place, would have to absolutely have a series of principles that guided those. And uh, we actually have a series that we've put up on our website, but the first one has to be protecting the First Amendment. And I don't think we can move forward with the discussion until we figure that piece out. But I, I'm not ready to say no yet. I've always thought that the way public broadcasting, the fact that it works as well as it does is one of um, 20th century's biggest miracles. I, I would also point out that NPR does news uh, a lot better than PBS does. And NPR could survive without government subsidies. And uh, I, I, I think that those two, fa and PBS couldn't. And I think those facts are related. So, so let's shift to the idea then of, of indirect support. And one indirect way, obviously, is through the tax code um, and nonprofit status of some form, either direct or some public-private uh, nonprofit partnership uh, is, is an obvious big way to do that. So what about Dan's idea that uh, one big problem with a nonprofit model is we currently have this limitation that if you're nonprofit, you can't endorse, you can't advocate. Uh, should we do away with that? Is that something that we need? Do we need news organizations who are benefiting from nonprofit status to be able to do that? Are there enough other voices? And if we do, do we worry about giving up that barrier, recent as it apparently is? <laughs> Dan, you want to argue with yourself? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to repeat myself. <laughs> So I mean, the question, Dan, maybe a question to throw back to you that I am curious about is in this sort of new world of media journalism, if you will, where there are a million and a, and a million squared voices, uh, how important is it that organizations that are sort of benefiting from nonprofit status, if we think about, you know, major news organizations that shift to a nonprofit model, how important is it that they actually be able to play this role when there are a zillion other people who can stand up and scream and yell and endorse candidates? Well, well, that's a good question, and I'm not really sure how important it is that they be able to do that, uh, other than the fact that, um, there is a limitation on their First Amendment rights, which just strikes me as completely outrageous for a news organization. Uh, I've actually talked with Paul Bass, the founder and editor of the New Haven Independent about this, and he's told me he doesn't want to endorse. It's, he's absolutely fine with this. He thinks it's uh, part of the price of being a nonprofit. Uh, so maybe I am arguing about this in somewhat of a theoretical way rather than a practical way. On the other hand, I do think as more and more of our local journalism becomes nonprofit, uh, you're taking more and more players off the field in terms of being able to have a vigorous discussion of politics. I can also tell you that the most useless endorsement a news organization can make is telling us who to vote for for president. I think it becomes very useful when you're talking about a myriad of local boards and you know planning commissions and sewer boards and things like that where as a citizen I am almost grateful to kind of outsource um, my vote to a to journalists who are keeping a close eye on this every day and and if I trust them to tell it to me straight I'd like to know who they think I ought to vote for because I'm kind of half paying attention and uh, I don't necessarily who I should go in and vote for. You know, it, it's funny, what our, our local papers where I live have become extremely reluctant to endorse in local races. I think they're afraid of offending anybody. And, uh, and I, I know the people who work for these papers. So uh, there was a local election a few years ago where I actually called up people at both papers and, and said, look, I know you're not doing endorsements this year. Who the hell should I vote for? And, and we had an off-the-record conversation that I found very useful. But I would have liked them to endorse. And of course, if they were nonprofits, they wouldn't have even been able to do that. You know, Pro probably they would have been, been uh, uh, endangering their nonprofit status just by having that conversation with me. 
Well, you know, one of the other dirty little secrets about what used to be, I think, back in the days when I was in a newsroom, kind of a vibrant endorsement system, I remember I worked for the St. Paul Pioneer Press for a very long time, and they were always very politically active in election season. They had an editorial page where they had seven or eight people on it, and they would bring in all sorts of candidates, and they would do a lot of work. They would interview everyone. They would sit down. They would deliberate. They would publish their endorsements. They are now down to one and a half people on that uh, editorial page. They couldn't do an endorsement and do it in, a, in an effective, informed way if they wanted to. And yet there may be other sites. I mean, I can't talk to that yeah. vicinity, but there may be other sites that have taken up that role that are expressly advocacy for particular candidates or causes. I mean, I do think, I agree with you, Dan, but I think we have to be careful about having this uh, uh, naive view of what the First Amendment does and is. I mean, the idea of limits on First Amendment rights of a news outlet, well, you know, what about the broadcast industry? They've been dealing with significant limits on their First Amendment rights for a long time and doesn't seem to be in question. In fact, Lee Bollinger has what I think is a very interesting new book out in which he says that is part of the uh, what is to be celebrated about our system is that we actually have several different ways that the First Amendment plays out in different media. And rather than a sign of inconsistency, he says, I don't know if I buy it, but I find it very interesting, he says that's a sign of strength. So uh, sort of narrowing down from thinking about all uh, all media activity and all journalism. I want to go back to, to Josh, something you said initially, and also there was a reference in an earlier panel to Clay Shirky's suggestion that what we really need to get through this and see what's on the other side is a whole lot of experimentation by a whole lot of people. I if that's the case, how do we think about uh, whatever it is, whether it's government support, whether it's indirect subsidies of some kind that supports that model rather than something that's aimed more at historic existing business models. Are there ways to do this so that we actually incubate? So, you know, we're really focusing on entrepreneurial ideas, new ways of doing this, whether it's some sort of fund for, you know, R&D and new startups. Is, is that an option instead of just looking at how do we kind of keep some version of what we have going? Right. You know, the government has invested incredible amounts of money in researching the ails of the body. So might we also think about investing a bunch of money in the ails of the democracy? I think there is an opportunity here to do something like an R&D fund. I mean, it's interesting you should mention the broadcaster's public interest obligations and some of the free speech things that go along with that. At the FCC's recent workshop on the future of media, um, the former FCC uh, chief economist said, let's get rid of public interest obligations. And instead, you know, broadcasters say their public interest investments equal I forget what the number is. Let's just charge them. Let's charge them a rental fee for the public spectrum, open up, get rid of public interest ob obligations, and put that money towards some sort of fund for journalism or local news. Now, what that fund might look like, we can debate. But I would love to see something like the Night News Challenge, which I think is one of the most really interesting sort of foundation efforts I've seen around journalism in recent years. Now, the problems that go along with it are similar to what Lucy said. You know, they fund you once off pretty much, and then you're out on your own, and you got to create a new project to get there and that sort of thing. So one of the things I'd like to see, and they fund maybe seven projects a year, maybe. What if we had something that could radically expand that? Maybe it was money from government that ran through night. Maybe it was something else. But could we fund that sort of experimentation in a way that's not going to get at content? Could we fund some sort of infrastructure, whether it's broadband or other, that would help these emerging technologies and experiments get off the ground? Could we create a training and technical assistance fund to help you know, do some of the, how do you set up a business model like the, like the Citizen Media Law Center is doing here? These are good questions, I think. I, I think the problem is, is that no matter what you do, it's, it's, it's fraught with politics. I mean, net neutrality, for example, even the term net neutrality is in itself a very non-neutral term. Um, <laughs> you know, bringing broadband to rural areas, which I think is a great idea, reminds me, though, of the, you know, the national interstate highway system, which, on the one hand, it spurred communication. On the other hand, it, it favored uh, suburban and, and country areas over the cities and led to the demise of many great cities throughout the country. So it's not really neutral, although it's presented as being neutral. I could see the big broadcasters getting really upset about broadband suddenly available everywhere and undermining their great uh, you know, monopolistic business practice. Um, on the other hand, look, that's... Uh, 
I mean, if government has a role, it ought to have a role in building infrastructure and, and, and at least trying to maintain at least the, the semblance of neutrality and allowing the market to kind of figure out where things are going to end up. Any other thoughts on this before we move on? So, John, before we leave this subject overall, I want to come back to the point you raised, which is kind of the flip side, that, that there's also perhaps some need to make sure that government steps back and stays out of the way at the appropriate moments. Do you want to say a little more about what you have in mind, what we might need to be worried about, and how that could, could cause a problem? Well, I, I, can, I can mention one example. I mean, there's, you know, we, are, we have been expecting for several months that, that uh, Chairman Boucher is going to be dropping a bill on sometime in the next, it was supposed to be March, it's probably sometime in, in April now. Um, uh, regulating, designed to regulate behavioral uh, targeting of, of advertising. And there are ways to look at behavioral targeting of advertising as a win for everybody. If it's done in a privacy protective way, it allows advertisers to reach consumers who are actually interested in their product, it, it allows consumers to see ads that they actually might be interested in rather than things that are of no relevance to them at all. And at the same time, it might help, um, it might help media companies, content providers, find a, an, ad, an additional foundation, another leg for the stool to keep, to keep these businesses alive so that we're not having to talk so much about how the government can, can bail out the, the media. So I, you know, I think we need to be very careful as we move down the road to, to, to regulating. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna pass on a comment I was gonna make. But so let's move on. I, I mean, one of the most intriguing things I heard from several of you in the beginning comments was this idea that you raised first, Lucy, of a, a backlash, that you know, there is a risk as we open up doing journalism to the whole world that uh, some people, judges, legislators, uh, people with control over information, don't like that for a variety of reasons. And as Cam said, you know, I think we do have to worry, maybe there are different ways to deal with it, but we do have to worry that uh, you know, this rush forward into this brave new world may have negative consequences. Um, uh, so let's throw that out. I, I'd love to hear more about that and, and think a little bit about what do we do about that short of saying, all right, well, let's not let those people go do that and let's not give coverage to citizen journalists under SHIELD laws and let's not let everyone have access to government records. Um, uh, there two areas I'll talk about that. One has to do with um, what public officials think about all of a sudden everybody having access to their records and their proceedings. And then I'll also talk about the shield law because I've been heavily involved in actually negotiating that, that monster. Um, you know, what I, I and I'm going to talk, in, it, it, this happens with all public officials, but I'm going to focus on courts because I think we have a lot of lawyers here in the office and you'll understand how judges think. Uh, maybe you will, maybe you won't. But um, the phrase I keep hearing from them is, you know, once it's out there, it's out there. I can't unring that bell. Once uh, information is released, it goes viral. I have to protect my jury pool. My sole obligation is to make sure that there is a fair uh, impaneled jury. I have to protect the identities and the privacy of the jurors. I mean, that's a concept I never used to think about, the privacy of the jurors. I mean, 200 years ago, we'd go to any trial in this country, walk in and everybody knew who the jurors were because they were your neighbors. But now, uh, the privacy of jurors is a huge value. Um, you're also seeing that judges don't like technology because a bunch of them have been really stung by jurors who are there looking up things on their Blackberries, tweeting, Twittering, whatever, um, you know, about what they've learned that day in court. Uh, and judges, ab above all, um, they're, they're good people. They try really, really hard, and what they really, really love is control. And they view it as their responsibility to control things, and that includes all of the information related to a case, because something comes to them, it's their responsibility to get it taken care of and then moved. But as I, they keep telling me over and over ag again, once that information goes up on the internet, there's nothing they can do to get it back. And uh, they are very, very cautious. Now, as far as who's going to be covered as a journalist, there were several issues going on with the debate over the Federal Shield Law that caused some stickiness. But right now where we are, uh, and, and greater detail about this is in your uh, prepared materials. 
uh, the House has passed a bill on a voice vote about a year ago that is a very, very good bill, except for one respect. It limits the coverage of who's a journalist to somebody who is basic, it's a livelihood test. In other words, you have to earn, if not your entire living, then at least something. You have to have a track record of having earned something as a quote unquote professional. It knocks out a lot of freelancers who've never had a contract before. It locks out a lot of student journalists. On the Senate side, we've been able to persuade them or we had been able to persuade them that the function test, a la the von Bülow test, that is in effect in most of the federal circuits, uh, is the way to go. And that is, you go to, the, you, the way it is now in the federal courts, you go to the court and say, you know, this person was behaving like a journalist. That at the time they gathered the information, they, they uh, represented to their source that they were doing journalism, that they, uh, got the information in exchange for a promise that they were going to go do journalism. They did something to it or that had some originality to it, and then they all along intended to disseminate it to an audience. And we, we got that adopted, but there's a problem. And that actually, there's two problems. Senators Feinstein and Durbin. Sure. And um, <laughs> they want, you know, Senator Feinstein describes it as a professionalism requirement. She doesn't want just anybody to be able to claim to be a journalist. Durbin is actually a bigger problem because he's Harry Reid's right-hand man, and if he says it's not going to the floor, it's just not going to go to the floor. So he wants some sort of language, and we've been negotiating with him. Basically, what we're trying to do is set up some language, and I think we'll be able to do it, that shows that the person seeking coverage as a journalist has some sort of track record of having done journalism in the past. Um, not necessarily earned money doing it, but has actually been published somewhere, internet, print, broadcast, whatever, at some point in the recent past that you can hang your hook on it so that you don't have a problem with citizens witnessing a crime or citizens being involved in a conversation, being t uh, summoned to a grand jury to testify and they all of a sudden decide they're a journalist. Uh, and they go off and blog about it. Uh, I, I think it's a valid concern. I think we'd be able to do something about it. How Lucy, it uh, oh, good. I, I was just wondering, the, the interesting thing about the shield law and the test that you described is that it's, um, it, it's designed to look at the act of journalism after the fact. One of the things I'm curious about is could we apply a similar test to the credentialing question? So that we have, you know, like the Center for Independent Media is a nonpartisan nonprofit a network of websites that covers state houses across the country. They've got about seven sites now. Um, and they've been ha having a terrible time getting credentials in some state houses and at the federal level. I think that basically is the test most state houses use. You go in there and say, I've been doing this type of work. A lot of credentials are not issued by a government or by a, you know, um, they are actually issued by a self-governing board of other journalists, which is kind of the problem. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, well, one, and one of the things that's in the in the policies of that uh, committee for at the federal level is this claim about how you make how the publication makes its income. So there's actually a litmus test in there for amount of foundation funding versus advertising funding, which can really strike out a lot of nonprofit journalism entities from that from being eligible, and so that's, it's interesting. That, I mean, I wonder if we could change that so that to open up, because I think. You know, for the last 40 years, we've had a magazine, and, a, and for the last 15, a website. We've had a newsletter. We do special publications, and the Department of Justice refuses to recognize the Reporters Committee as a journalism organization. Exactly. So. But, I mean, but the other side of that is that there are only so many seats in the press gallery, right. and do you let do you let the blogger with an audience of a thousand readers take a seat away from the New York Times? Well, if you believe current numbers, the, those seats are opening up more and more. It's true. <laughs> May not be an issue for long. Unfortunately. And, and the blogger probably has more readers than the New York Times. <laughs> so, Cam, I want to go back to your concerns about you know having too much privileges for too many privileges spread too broadly, really diluting and maybe risking the privilege for all. Is there a way to draw some line with things like shield laws? whether it's based on the act of 
doing journalism or something else where you really cover people who in a meaningful sense should be, but it doesn't look like everyone, it isn't as scary, it doesn't have the same risk? I, I, I don't know where that line is, and I'm not that knowledgeable about it, so I think Lucy should draw that line. <laughs> but I, I, think some, I think some kind of line has to be drawn, and I just wrote down here on my paper, antibiotics. It reminds me of antibiotics, because everybody who's sick wants antibiotics. But if everybody gets antibiotics, then antibiotic strains of antibiotic resistance strain of bacteria will rise up and kill all of us. It's the same thing with the First Amendment. Everybody wants the protection of the First Amendment. The reality TV shows, the tabloids, the bloggers, the, the TMZs of the world, and I represent a lot of those people, and I'm the first one to say, hey, this is news gathering. I know it looks like entertainment to you, or it looks like you know reality, whatever to you, but it's news gathering, and it ought to be protected by the First Amendment, and lots of times we're successful in arguing that. But eventually, we, we run into First Amendment resistant judges, if we can call them that, who just don't like the way we look. And they write opinions and the law changes and the law is changing in a number of these different areas that's going to end up harming all of us. So we need somebody to be the, the czar, the First Amendment czar, to say, you can make this argument, but you shouldn't because you're gonna get all of us sick. The, the Communications Decency Act is a really good example of that. And I think Rob mentioned that before. It's gone wild. Everybody now claims the protection of the Communications Decency Act. And I, I, I'm here to say that we're all in for a big problem because somebody is going to kill that Communications Decency Act before we know it, and we're all going to be sorry. So I'd love to have all of you jump in and address this, but there are two ways to look at this. One is that things like the Communications Decency Act, they go too far, there's a backlash, we're all in trouble. The other way to look at the CDA is you know, we've had it for 12 years now, or 14. There have been some really crazy cases that people just hate, and yet, by and large, judges are still following it. Congress hasn't gotten too worked up and jumped in. It could be that rather than all of us ultimately dying, we're going through a period where, you know, it's sort of shifting expectations, and as, you know, lots of citizen journalists begin to get these privileges and use them, it won't seem like such a big deal anymore. What do you think? Is this, should we really worry we're going to poison it for everybody, or is this just a rough period and we're going to come out the other side thinking, all right, I think we bad. just haven't seen a nasty enough case um, where... Involving uh, a senator's daughter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, something will happen. I mean, I, I, it's not something I worry about every day, but it's certainly a, something I've thought about, Section 230. Um, uh, and, and quite honestly, it has to do with a lot of these commenter things. I'm a little bit sensitive to all of that, right? Because I, I get bashed in those comments a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, Sauce for the goose, sauce for yeah, the goose. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, there are not that many areas of the law or that many places where we have to worry about who's a journalist and who's not. There really aren't. Because access laws, by and large, you know, whether you have access to a court, access to a court record, access to a city council meeting, that's not any more or less of a right than a citizen has. Um, it, there are plenty of examples of that. You really only run into that problem when you're looking for a special privilege for someone. Subjecting journalists to something that the rest of the public does, and shield laws are, I think, the most obvious example of that. And credentialing, uh, I, in my head, credentialing is more of a time, place, and manner restriction than anything. You have to give people, it, it's, a, it's a limitation on your capacity. And you have to pick certain people to give preference to because those people have a broader audience. So in those cases, fine. And then when the biggest credentialing disputes we get involved in, there's not a heck of a lot we can do, and it has to do with sports. Uh, and high school leagues, uh, and what you can do uh, to resell the photos you take of the, you know, the kids' basketball game in Wisconsin, or um, what, you know, what can you do with what you shoot at the Masters? Everybody thinks that's a public event. Well, it's not. Uh, they can tell you precisely what to do there. It's held so. at a club that doesn't admit women. Yeah, it's just... Uh, and, and a lot of folks think that journalists have all of these rights to big sporting events. Uh, and no, they don't. But anyway. I agree with Kim about the, um, 
the worries about the effect of sort of everybody claiming these First Amendment rights. But, I, you know, I, I look at it sort of like, you know, people say it would be a great form of government to have a benevolent dictatorship. I don't know how you come up with that czar. Right. Um, and I oh, think that's, that's fundamentally right. it has to be Lucy. antithetical to our system to say that we could have a czar who decides who can be a journalist and who can't. So that says we have to go to some other kind of solution. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the only one I've come to is one that's somewhat Pollyanna-ish, which is that we somehow come to a realization that we're all in this together. Um, because I worry about the copyright issues that go on when we all, you know, when our clients are benefiting on both sides of the copyright equation. And I worry about the credentialing issues where it becomes a faction of the field coming against another one. And, uh, you know, although that might serve short-term gains, I'm not sure it serves long-term gains. Well, here's, just this week, um, on Tuesday, I got, two, Monday and Tuesday, I got two calls about this. And it's a technology example. Reporters in... Uh, New York, one in New York City Hall, one in uh, Westchester County, called and said, all of a sudden, there are new rules passed by the city councils, and I think in New York it was the case of it was the mayor's office. All of a sudden, they're no longer allowed to bring in certain types of technology to the entire city hall. They can't bring in, use cell phones, they can't use the, the cell phone uh, cameras. They can't bring in their laptops. There are certain places they can no longer go. They're not allowed to take photographs of anyone in the hallways. And I said, uh, and so they wanted quotes from me. And at what I was able to put together uh, in the last, I don't know, six months that I've been getting these calls have been kind of trickling in. It's usually a situation where somebody, some citizen has come in with, you know, a, a geeky looking video camera and a cell phone, and they go around and they start taking pictures of everybody in the hallways, and then they demand to get in with the press section in the, you know, at, at press conferences, but then they will go in, and in the case of this one guy, he would just go into a city council member's chambers in the waiting room, put a camera in the secretary's face and demand to see the guy, and then go to the county recorder's office and harass all of the employees who, guess what, have complained to their bosses about a hostile work environment. So what are those folks supposed to do? Now, most of the time, I have to admit, when I was a lawyer, I did have to deal with professional journalists who behaved in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, by and large, the folks that do that every day aren't quite that rude. Wait, have, have you read Gawker or... <laughs> TMZ, they, that's exactly what they do. They go right in people's faces and film them. And, and, and there's a backlash to that. So the way they do it, and they've got city attorneys who say, look, you can't ban, so they just ban it for everybody. And say, no technology in the building. Thank you, every month. Thank you, everybody, all the rules apply to everybody. And, and I never really thought about this. The one reporter who called me said, you know, I used to take my cell phone um, into the phone booths that they had, because all the old old style courthouses and city halls had those awkward, funky phone booths. And he said, I'd just go in there and call. He said, but then they ripped out the phone booths because they didn't have to have pay phones anymore because everybody had a cell phone. And now they've told me I can't have my cell phone, so I essentially cannot communicate with the office anymore. I don't know which one of our founding fathers it was, but one of them said something like, there's a certain amount of abuse inseparable from the proper use of anything. And in no area is that more true than of the press. And I think that's exactly what we're hitting here. John, you were trying to jump in. No, I was just, I was just, I was just thinking about the flip side of this, of this government official worrying about somebody who, if you don't ban the device, you're very likely as the government official to be, ban to be facing a lawsuit based on content-based content. restrictions on who can be admitted. Exactly. It's a, it's a thorny problem. So thoughts on what we do? I mean, we can't have a czar, right? That's, that raises all sorts of problems. You can't just say, uh, you stay home, you come in, um, either among you know, mainstream journalists and new journalists or among certain new journalists. So sh is there something we can be doing to solve the problem short of letting uh, courts and others just ban everyone? Go ahead, Dan. I've been, I've been sitting here listening to this, and 
I've been, I've been holding back because I, I don't have even a remote possible solution to what I'm hearing. But um, what, what really kind of strikes me is this idea that, well, we don't want to push the First Amendment too far because we don't know what officialdom will do. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that it's fundamental to the First Amendment, that the First Amendment is not for journalists. It's for everybody. And um, some of the problems that we're discussing here about credentialing are difficult ones because there's no question that you can't let you know, 10,000 people into a courtroom, even if 10,000 people might want to go and, uh, and, and write for their blogs about it. Uh, but um, I think that any potential solution to the issues we're talking about that involves trying to make a decision as to who's a journalist and who isn't um, is, is just really troubling to me. And as I said, I don't have a proposed solution to any of these issues. I just hope that, I just hope that as we think through these issues, we can hit upon possible solutions that don't involve making that kind of division. I think that lawyers, all of us, need to just be more conscious of the fact that we're going to lose some of these arguments, and when we lose them, we make bad law. And look, you know, I, I, I have made these arguments, and I have lost them, and there are, is precedent out there with my name on it that I regret having brought such a case or convinced a client to make such an argument. One thing I think we are seeing now, Lucy mentioned this, which is a result, I think, of money, but it's, I think, had a good effect, which is news organizations don't fight subpoenas as often as they do. They just don't have the money to do it anymore. It used to be when I first worked at CBS, every time you got a subpoena from anybody, you went in and filed a motion to quash if you, if you, you know, if you couldn't get them to withdraw it. Now, people tend to cooperate. They'll try to carve out a small little world and say, "Can you know, we'll give you this two, minute, two minutes of footage if you'll go away. There seems to be less of a visceral, you know, we're going to move to quash. And, and, you know, part of me thinks that's a good thing because the more those arguments were being made, the more the First Amendment was being pushed, the more bad law was being created. And I think as a result of financial considerations, um, people have tempered the First Amendment arguments, and I think the result has, has, has been good. Well, one of the practical ways that has played out, though, that I've definitely noticed over the last 10 years, as more newsrooms were using the Internet more, and this is both in print and in broadcast, a lot of them would challenge a subpoena in the past, but now they're saying, okay, we've got all this digital archive of the photos we shot at the protest, or we've got those notes, uh, and if you don't have the protection of a vibrant shield law and you can't make the subpoena go away, what you do is you put the whole thing up on your website before you turn it over to whoever it is they want it, and say, as long as we're being transparent about what we have, and we're not favoring one party to this litigation, maybe that's a way to do it. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. But there are some organizations that have been cornered that have done that, um, and uh, you know, I, I, it's hard to fault them for it. Let's uh, spend just a couple of minutes on one last issue that I think might very well work back into this, be careful how far you reach, be careful what you might do, because it might ultimately backfire. And that's the idea of anti-slap laws uh, in various states. Lots of states now have them. These are laws that allow someone who is sued uh, to go into court with a, usually a special motion to dismiss very early before any discovery happens. Um, and essentially claim that the lawsuit has no merit and is, is basically just a lawsuit brought to shut up criticism or shut up unwanted speech rather than being genuinely designed to, to resolve a legitimate grievance. Um, and they provide a way to get rid of the suits early and they very often provide attorney's fees for uh, the, the person who brings the suit if they prevail. Um, and more and more, you're seeing all sorts of people using them, but more and more we're seeing citizen journalists, non-traditional journalists uh, use them. Do you see anti-slap laws, and I know a couple of you have, have some first-hand <laughs> familiarity with them, uh, do you see anti-slap laws playing a bigger role in protecting 
the ability of, of sort of non-mainstream media to, to do the job of journalism and, and really get out there? Oh, Is it a yeah. significant role that we should be pushing for in more states? And should we be worried, what we were saying a minute ago, if, if, we, if everyone starts to bring them and too many people start using them where there really is a decent case, judges will start to say, oh, well, forget it. We're not going to really pay attention oh, to those. I don't worry about that at all with the slap stuff. And I think particular, I think it's California's law that I like the best. And the ones that work the best are not the ones that provide protection just for, quote, unquote, the media, but for anyone who's being shut up. Um, and just so you know, there is an effort, there has been a bill um, underway, I don't know if it's been dropped yet or not, a federal anti-slap law, which I, I think we're probably eight or ten years away from getting anything done, and it provides certain, there's some strange elements to doing something on the federal level when basically you're dealing with a state cause of action. But, um, you know, there is an effort by a bunch of folks out in California to get a federal law passed. The, there's certainly, at least under the current law, there's certainly no anti-slap protection for journalists in Massachusetts. Um, I uh, actually uh, wrote an affidavit for uh, the defendant in a libel suit in Massachusetts, uh, a woman named Freda Hollander, who was a community activist and journalist who uh, tried to uh, claim anti-slap protection when she was sued for libel by a developer in the North End. What was interesting about it was that her lawyer um, pretty clearly understood that the anti-slap statute in Massachusetts did not apply to journalists. So therefore, he tried to construct this very uh, narrow and interesting argument that the anti-slap law should pertain to certain types of advocacy journalism that 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 Freda Hollander was actually engaging in uh, the sort of political activism that the anti-slap suit was designed to protect. Only she was doing it as a journalist, and uh, they lost it pretty much every step, and and ended up losing before the uh, the state supreme judicial court a few months ago. So what that means is that Freda, if Freda Hollander wants to protect a source or wants to cover the local football game, she wants to be a journalist. But if she's seeking the protection of the anti-slap law, she wants to be sure she's not a journalist. Makes a lot of sense, right? You know, one thing, I, one thing um, that I think is happening because of the protections of the CDA is companies are now going after the people who actually post the complaints because I think they're beginning to realize, oh, we can't do this. So I, I have a, a client who posts a lot of consumer complaints and he told me now every day he gets an email from somebody who posted a complaint who says, could you please take my complaint down? The company is threatening to sue me. I really don't want to get involved in this. Please just remove my post. And he doesn't want to because he doesn't want to have to give in to this. On the other hand, he feels terrible for the person who's getting sued or threatened to be sued. That's where I think an anti-slap yeah. statute like California's would be great if, if you know, there were some kind of national or there were more of them because those people are clearly being shut up by the threat of litigation. It's usually real estate developers too. Right, and that was certainly why most of the original yeah, anti-slap Real estate developers, real estate agents. What does he do? Does he take them down? Um, he hasn't, but actually the last one he asked me about, I think he was going to take down. I think he's, cha he's, he's changing. It's, you know, he's very conflicted about it. He's very pro-consumer, but on the other hand, you know, now he feels like people's lives are being ruined because of stuff they wish they hadn't posted. All right. All great stuff. Let's stop there. I want to make sure we have a chance for, for all of you to ask questions. It's a wide open field of great issues. So be sure to push the button uh, so we can hear you. Yes. Uh, hello. Hi. Fantastic day. Thank you so much. Here's my. Here's where I'm confused. Um, I'm about to put up a website, so I'll be functioning as a publisher, an editor, and a writer. So, in, especially in terms of comments, because I'm trying to decide whether to have them open, whether to have them moderated, whether to filter them prior to publishing them. Um, the, the cases that, we've, uh, that you've talked about, you've got situations where, you know, old school, as I was taught, you know, you, as a journalist, if somebody comments anonymously, you protect that. You would go to, you would be in contempt of court to protect 
that anonymity. What I'm confused about is why that anonymity doesn't appear to hold what if somebody comments anonymously on a, on a website. No, you still, you still have protect. I mean, there's... I'm talking about the person commenting because we've got, we've got people within the website essentially deciding, you were talking about somebody decides in, in one sense if, if the slap law applies, they're a journalist or not a journalist. Well, I'm sort of hearing the same thing about online journalism. In one sense, you're a journalist if you're going to be held in contempt of court to protect a source. And then in another sense, you're not a journalist because you use privileged information that a commenter didn't supply to you with the intent of providing you with a story. They've done it clearly anonymously or pseudonymously, or whatever you want to call it. And then you've researched a story. So it seems to me that they have implicitly and explicitly said to you, this is not, a pub this is not for publication to be attributed back to me personally. And as a writer, I constantly have people say to me, you can't comment, you can't attach my name to that comment. I couldn't exist as a journalist or a writer with any credibility if I ever um, sort of broke that. You're on the record, you're not on the record. That's a, that's a constant thing that you deal with in terms of journalism. So I'm confused legally and ethically. Not, not ethically, actually. Ethically, if somebody commented on a blog I ran and the understanding was it was anonymous, I would never out that person. I think that's unethical. What I want to know is, is it legal or not? Because it seems to me we're talking about it being, um, well, I want, I'm going to tell you as a journalist, I don't think it's ethical to out somebody who has made an let's, anonymous well, Why don't we let, I, we've got three or four people ready to jump on this with a good answer, so let's let them him, get started story? on it. I'll, John, you want to start? I'll jump well. in. I, there are lawyers who have made the argument that posters, yeah. blog posters, are equivalent to confidential sources. I find that a very dangerous road to go down. No, um, and if not. I were operating a website, I would not want to have a, a, a privacy policy on my website that says I will never give up the names of posters to the website. And it partly goes back to—I mean, partly goes back to the point that, that Lucy lev led with, which is media companies, people operating websites, have increasingly limited resources and how much money do you want to be able do you, are you willing to spend to fight a subpoena to identify somebody who you who, who has merely been a poster or a commenter on a blog as opposed to somebody who's been a confidential source for you as a journalist right. who, for, uh, and I, I, on whose on whose uh, confidential information you've been basing your own reporting. And I think there's a, an important distinction. There. As a practical matter, um, and I apologize, I'm gonna have to run to the airport, but um, as a practical matter on our website, I would never promise anyone that um, I would, you know, I would negotiate with them saying, you post on here, under certain circumstances, we may have to identify you. At the same time, if I were going to be writing an original story, using an original source, and I make that promise to keep that source's identity confidential, in my mind, that's a totally different thing. And in each situation, you're having a negotiation with that person. Um, but if it's in your story, it's, it would, depending on where you live uh, and what court you're in, uh, it would be you know, something you could protect. Um, but I would never say on a the comment section of my website, I will protect you at all costs because you can't. But the law does provide some protection for anonymous posters, right? They, they, you've yeah. got to subpoena the yeah. site and the it's, site gets to our, the site can easy. move, right. It's, you don't necessarily have to give them over. But the protection is certainly much stronger if you treat the person as a source. On the other hand, treating a poster like a source is, I think, a serious mistake. Yes. Um, you kind of, uh, I'm sorry Lucy's leaving, but, um, <laughs> but um, I, uh, you kind of address the Massachusetts case, which is the legal aspect of it, but I'm concerned about when you talk, you talked about nonprofits doing media, doing journalism, when you haven't, I mean, Lucy, I love your organization, but you're an advocacy group yeah. for First Amendment issues, and when you're doing journalism, you have a point of view, and there are other mm -hmm. examples, they're not all, mm -hmm. all Nonprofits are not ProPublica, which is, mm -hmm. you know, neutral or whatever. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm just raising the issue of more from a journalism ethics point of view, because you, like I said, you kind of covered some of the legal aspects of it. But what does that mean when you have a validly organizations with their avowed purpose or reason or, you know, uh, point of view doing journalism? Well, you know, there wasn't a single newspaper in this country 250 years ago that didn't have a perspective and didn't advocate something. I mean, that's what we're, this country was founded on. And yes, we do have a perspective and we do advocate certain things within the parameters of the IRS code, I would need to point out, um, for the record. Uh, but it, my, my, my kvetching about that really had more to do with the fact that the Department of Justice does recognize other organizations like the National Security Archive and POGO and all of those folks uh, who have similar websites and they are considered journalists. So, but that's, even yeah. Fox News. Even Fox, jeez. <laughs> they don't have a point of view. Lucy, thank you so much. Thank Sorry you, you have to run, but we all thank you. Yes. So um, one, this, is, this is a question. Um, one of the things I've heard kind of to summarize the arc of the day is sort of this argument or this feeling that, you know, reporting is a pub of public value. This original reporting that we do is, is publicly valuable. And then B, sort of the, the realization or the, the sad understanding that the market-based mechanisms that once provided that public value are have at least temporarily stopped working. And then C, when it gets this question of is there, a, is there a role for public subsidy or public policy, there's this immediate visceral reaction against it. So what I'm hearing your ultimate argument as being is that, well, the market will take care of it. Eventually the market will turn around and, and things, will be, things will be okay. And I just wanted to ask, is that what you're arguing? No, not at all. Um... I would suggest that a lot of the talk about subsidies and, uh, and, and uh, well, especially about subsidies, is geared toward thinking about how we can preserve the journalism order as it has always been. Um, aside from wanting my students to get jobs, uh, which is a very real concern, um, I don't, I couldn't care less if the journalism order that we've had up to this point survives as long as we have journalism. Um, you know, we had this incredible expansion of journalism as a business from 1960 to 2005. And it may have been that that era was the anomaly and that now we're returning to something a little bit more historically normal. Um, you know, the Washington Post, I, I don't have numbers for you, but the Washington Post, like any news organization, has cut and cut and cut in the last few years. And you know what? They have finally cut to the point where the newsroom is about the same size that it was when they broke Watergate. Um, so as, as much as I want to see good jobs for journalists, especially for my students, uh, I don't think it's necessarily the end of the world that the journalism business may be shrinking toward a more sustainable level. Uh, as I, I don't think anybody thinks it's going to shrink to zero. Uh, last year, the Boston Globe was in crisis. This year, at a much smaller size than they were a few years ago, they seem to be at some sort of equilibrium, and I certainly hope that that continues. Yeah, I think, Dan, the dates you just gave, 1965 to 2005, are also, you might say, the, the years of mass media consolidation as well. Yep. Um, much of that consolidation uh, helped cause some of the problems that we're in right now, and media companies being over-leveraged to the point where they were cutting newsroom jobs to pay for debt that they had collected, gathering more newsrooms under their belt. Um, so, you know, while we celebrate that growth, we should be careful about where that growth came from and what it means for us now. I also think uh, that we need to look at this idea of market failure much closer. I don't think anyone's done the big market failure analysis yet that needs to be done here, but there are some stats that we should keep in mind. The Pew State of Media, JLab at American University, um, a new book by John Nichols and, um, John, and Robert McChesney, 
and also a recent blog post by Steve Buttry all make the claim that there is not enough foundation money, or, well, Steve doesn't make this claim, not enough foundation money to support the extent of journalism we need. Steve says there's not enough foundation money to replace all of journalism out there. Um, there's also a sense, in the, especially in the Pew State of Media report that just came out, that the way advertisements are going right now, that there's not going to be enough advertising dollars. And then there's this question of paywalls and whether that's what a subscription model work. All, all said, this gets to your point, I do believe that we're facing what could be a market failure. And going back to, I'm sorry Lucy left again, but going back to what Lucy said, the difference between libra librarians and journalists is that uh, taxpayers will still foot the bill for librarians. I think we may need to look at that eventually. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you picked 1965. I, when I teach a news gathering course, I tell my students that it really began with the Post's reporting on Watergate, and Woodward and Bernstein became the sort of first journalist rock stars. And in that moment, which in some respects was a high point of journalism, it was also the beginning of the low point, because I think what happened was you had this cult of journalist as rock star, and a lot of that led to some of the excesses, I think, that we have seen in journalism. And, you know, maybe we are in, a, in a, an appropriate winnowing period where we are returning to some more normal state. I don't know, but it, it clearly something happened in the late 60s and 70s to change the way that journalism had been practiced in the United States. How that news organizations, especially financial journalists, they have not been paying sufficient attention to Wall Street, especially when Wall Street has been developing some very dangerous uh, products. What happened? Why did they keep quiet about it? And while we're at it, why did they? Why were they complicit in the run-up towards the war in Iraq? Well, I mean, the one, interest, one interesting point, um, somebody said earlier, you know, if, gov if you're being paid by government, then you're going to be, you know, kowtowing to government. But, you know, I recently saw this whole montage of Katie Couric walking with, I think it was, um, I'm sorry, uh, I think it was Joe Biden for an interview she was doing. And, you know, the, all these nice montages and that sort of thing. And I think we've seen, especially among um, some level of journalists, not all by any means, but some in, the, in sort of broadcast mainstream journalism, uh, uh, cozying up to power to get the interviews, to get the eyeballs, to get the ads. And so we shouldn't dismiss the way that commercial journalism also can lead to cozying up of power as well. We Although tend to cover many stories as if they were sporting events. Mm. And uh, certainly in the uh, run up to the financial crisis, um, there were a lot of news organizations that wanted to cover the winning team. Yeah. It was but, also you know, a very complicated story, and there weren't probably not a lot of journalists who were who had the sophistication it. to understand it. And also, cozying up to cozying up to the political powers is there's nothing new. You know, journalists used to play poker and smoke cigars with Harry Truman, and you know, no everybody knew about Roosevelt's illness, but nobody wanted to you know d disclose that. So you know that access has always been the issue, and getting access means you know cozying up to people. Any other questions? You obviously know there's a reception uh, right afterward, and you're anxious to get to that. So let's let's move along to that. Let me thank our panelists uh, hugely for their help.